Thanks, Steve. Yeah, well, Steve's done a, a quick introduction there. To give it a bit of a fuller introduction, my name's Andy Glow. I'm one of the founders of Precision Fuel and Hydration. I'm ably assisted by the lovely Pierre today. Um, most of you will be thinking, ah, oh, Pierre, he's just here to, you know, to look good on stage, and, but I can assure you it's more than that. He's more than just beautiful. He's actually a really good runner as well. And Pierre came top 10 in the MDS last year. And so where I talk about some of the theories behind uh, heat acclimation and hydration, Pierre is going to offer some practical insights from his experience in building up to the race last year and what he's doing for the event this year as well. So um, to get into it, heat acclimation and hydration, big topics I'm sure on the front of everyone's minds for the, for the Marathon des Sable. It's gonna be hot where you go. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you as an audience is if you can tell me what the optimum temperature for running long distances is. If you get to run marathons or ultras in any temperature, what does science tell us is the optimum temperature? Anyone want to hazard a guess? I've heard eight, I've heard 12, any? 13, 15? That's very good, you're all in the right zone. And in fact, science tells us that the optimum temperature for distance running is somewhere between 7 and 15 degrees Celsius. It depends a little bit on the distance and the pace and things like that, which is what makes the MDS such a frankly ridiculous event because <laughs> it is not going to be anywhere near to those temperatures. The reason that temperature is so important when you're doing an endurance run is that it challenges your ability to thermoregulate. What that means is that your core body temperature exists within a very narrow window. Usually we're sat in here at around 37 Celsius and if you get up as high as 40 Celsius or a little bit over, you can get into real trouble. So you haven't got much room for manoeuvre. When you start running through the desert and it's very, very hot, there's lots of ways in which heat is being produced in the body by, by your metabolism, mainly from your working muscles and there's very little opportunity to offload that excess heat that's generated to the environment because the environment is so hot. That is a fundamental challenge that you're gonna to need to overcome doing the MDS. So we're gonna focus a lot of this talk on ways in which you can prepare both physi physiologically and in other ways to actually get over this issue. So how can you thermoregulate? How can you improve your ability to cope with the heat when you're running long distances? There's four main things we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at how increasing your general aerobic fitness can improve your ability to thermoregulate. We're gonna look in detail at acclimation or acclimatization, how you can actually physiologically adapt to be better in the heat. We're gonna look at what effect pacing good and bad will have on whether you do well in the heat and we're going to look at hydration and what you need to do there. So the first point, increased aerobic fitness. This graph can be a little bit difficult to get your head around to start with but what it essentially shows is that people who are very very fit, i.e. elite marathon runners, tend to see less degradation in their performance in hot conditions than slower runners. So on the far side of the graph, you've got people who do a marathon in about 127 minutes. So some of you are doing the maths quickly in your head, that's two hours and seven minutes, which is not bad for a marathon. Those people, <laughs> even when the temperature gets up relatively high, 25 degrees, they, they see something like a two and a half percent decrement in their performance on average. At, at, to their, to their finishing times in hot conditions. If you take it out as far as 180 minutes, so obviously three hours, you know, totally rubbish time for a marathon, <laughs> those unfit laggards at the back there <laughs> are gonna lose somewhere close to 20 or 25% on average, which is a staggering difference, isn't it? Because most of us would consider someone who can run a three hour marathon to be pretty fit. But at the elite end, when you've got people who are extremely well conditioned, they cope with the heat way, way better. And you can imagine if that graph goes on, how much more difference there, are, there is. So the biggest message 
that that tells us is that getting to your peak aerobic fitness, whatever peak aerobic fitness is for you, by doing lots and lots of training volume, the most you can cope with, by making sure that you're as aerobically well conditioned as possible when you go into this event, will pay huge dividends, not only in your ability to complete the distance, but to cope with the temperature as well. And at this point, I thought I'd hand it over to Pierre to give us a bit of insight into what kind of training load and training volume it takes to, to be in the top 10. Um, for me, first of all, it was quite unexpected to be top 10. Uh, I'm a good marathon runner. I had a, a time of uh, 2.45 uh, on marathon going into that race. Now it's 2.35. Uh, but basically, I think if you can get six hours of fitness, up to 10 hours of fitness, that would be plenty. Whether you use the, the bicycle, whether you use uh, the running or the hiking, it doesn't really matter in my opinion. People think of the MDS as a running event. Realistically, a lot of the people will be walking a lot of the time. So as long as you are able to have a sustained heart rate for three, four, five hours each day and one day after the other, I think that will go a long way in getting you to the finish line. So trying to cross the activities. Even if you like kayaking, for example, or if you like uh, climbing, or if you like spinning, just add all of these in your training. Don't just consider your running training and see how many hours of running you have per week, because that's not how it works. Put all your activities, if you do a lot of gardening, count this as an activity. All these hours, five to 10 hours approximately per week, and that will get you to, the, to, the, to where you want to be. Yeah, I think that's really great advice, Pierre, because I think accumulating hours outside of running, because running often leads to injuries, and you're going to need to do a reasonable amount of running to do the MBS, but you, you can also accumulate those hours in other aerobic sports and make sure that, that you get those fitness gains without getting the injuries. The next point, number two, was acclimation and acclimatisation. So this is the process of exposing your body to the heat, and allowing it to adapt. And the good news is that from an evolutionary perspective, the human body is really, really good at adapting to the heat. We came from the plains of Africa where it's very hot and dry. And so we have the capability to perform pretty well as endurance animals in that hot and dry environment. We lose some of those adaptations when we spend time away from the heat, but they come back pretty quickly as well. So you'll have noticed this anytime you've been on holiday to a hot country, you can land and it can feel really hot and oppressive and difficult to, to, to move, difficult to do anything without sweating and feeling tired. But within a two or three days, you're starting to get more into a normal routine. And as athletes preparing for a, a hot event like the MBS, we can take advantage of that by doing some proactive training in a hot environment in the immediate build-up in order to drive some of those adaptations. Now, the main adaptations you're going to get from training in the heat are things like you're going to see an expansion of your blood plasma volume and that happens within as it shows on there within two to seven days so within two to seven days of training in a hot environment you're going to increase your blood volume which helps reduce the cardiovascular strain of performing in the heat you're going to see a decrease in your heart rate which is partly because of that increased plasma volume you're going to see your resting core temperature improve you're going to make you're going to also see a decrease in what's called your RPE, your rating of perceived exertion, which is, which is how hard it feels like you're exercising in that environment. And there's other adaptations as well, inc including increases in your sweat rate and changes in your sweat composition that help you cool down and conserve fluids and ele uh, conserve electrolytes as well. These adaptations all happen relatively rapidly. So within 14 days, you can become pretty well acclimatized to the heat you'll probably get um, over 90% of the adaptations you're ever going to get with inside two or three weeks if you do a structured training plan in the heat. And these graphs up here are from the guys at Porsche Human Performance and Tristan is at the back here and he can wave so you can all see him. But they're out in the hall. They offer heat acclimatization training in the build-up to the MDS. And this uh, data is from a few years ago. It shows on the two graphs, the white line being the first session someone did in the heat and the uh, orange line being the fifth session someone did in the heat in, in the tre on the treadmill in their chamber. And measuring the, uh, the heart rate and the core body temperature, you, you can see that both times, walking at the same intensity in the same environment, five sessions apart, we see a noticeable drop in core body temperature and heart rate. And that's a clear, clear sign that that people, that, you, that people adapt and tolerate the heat a lot better. 
and this data is not particularly cherry picked, this is fairly typical response. And what these people have done is one hour of training in the heat five times in the last 10 days before the event, something like that. So although you might feel like it's a big task to take on to fully acclimate to being in the desert with a little bit of inventive thinking, a little bit of persistence in the last couple of weeks, you can do quite a lot to improve your core body temperature response to that environment. So because those heat adaptations happen really quickly, they also tend to get lost pretty quickly. So I wouldn't say that doing any heat training further out from the event is a waste of time because it, it builds experience and it, it allows you to sort of feel what some of the ad adaptations are like. In order to maximise the benefits, you need to do some of it very close to the event. And I think at this point I'll ask Pierre to chat about how he prepared last year because that was one of the features of his heat acclimation. I think I prepared really well because I was on holiday. So I was with my wife, my three-year-old and my six-year-old building sand castles on the beach in Spain. And I was lucky to do that for about three, four weeks. Um, so yeah, the environment was perfect. The summer was very hot in Europe for everyone. Um, last year was pretty much the same. Basically by lunchtime it was about 35, 37, 40 degrees on the beach. So of course no shade. So then we put the baby to bed and then I went out running for an hour or two hours on the beach. Uh, most of the time with no rucksack. But the idea was to try and, and simulate the conditions that I would think uh, would be normal in the MDS. October 21 was not a normal MDS, but um, it, it allowed me to acclimatize to that. So I, I trained for three, four weeks in a hot environment at the hottest moment of the day. Then I went back to the UK. I worked, I think I had five weeks, during which, like uh, Andy said, I had to keep my acclimation. And I couldn't use the heat chamber because it's the beginning of the academic year and university is no longer open to the public in September, October because they've got too many students. Also, there was COVID as an issue. So, so I was told I couldn't use the heat chamber. So in order to not lose my four weeks of hard work over there, I decided to buy a 30 pound sauna suit. And I was using this on the turbo trainer on my balcony and I was using it in the gym on the treadmill. Uh, so again, you do a one hour or one hour and a half session with a sauna suit, for me, it replicated very, very much the fluid loss I was experiencing on the beach, which was about an, a liter and a half per hour. And, and I did that every other day. The day I wasn't training like this, I was going into a hot bath for maybe 35, 40, 45 minutes. Again, trying to increase that progressively. I was using a standard home thermometer to monitor my core temperature because I've been warned about the, the risks. Uh, and again, I was doing this at home, so my wife was there. Um, and the other thing is I was doing the sauna, but I mean, f to be honest, the sauna, more than 20 minutes for me, didn't really work. It was just too hot. Uh, so I stick to the um, sauna suit, uh, which was fantastic. And I would advise you to get one of those. And, and also just a hot bath after a day at work or even after a jog or something like this. You stay in there for 40, 45 minutes. You're really, really sweating a lot. And that keeps your acclimation or starts your acclimation, depending on what you've done before. Fantastic. Yeah, I think really good advice um, on the basis that you don't have to make this heat, um, heat training overly technical. Um, one thing to say, though, is that, as Pierre mentioned, don't ever do heat training alone. It, if you push yourself into a, a position of hyperthermia and get too hot, you can collapse very quickly. If you're in a hot environment, you won't cool down and the consequences could be very severe. So you always do heat training under supervision, always do it sensibly and always stop before you start to feel really, really bad. Because if you're not monitoring your core body temperature or someone isn't doing that, the, the going from being okay to not okay can happen really, really quickly. So be, be you know, You've, you've got to progress and push your body a little bit, but you've also got to be very, very mindful of the risks and, and take care when you're doing any sort of home type heat training. The third point is a huge one, it's to do with pacing. And pacing is incredibly important because most of the heat that you're trying to offload to the environment in the desert is going to be coming from your working muscles. The harder you run or walk, the faster you move, the more heat you'll produce, the more heat you have to offload. That should be obvious to you because even on a cold day, if you go out running 
in this country, in, even in shorts and a t-shirt in the winter, after a while, if you run hard enough, you can work up a sweat, even if the air temperature is close to freezing. You imagine what it's going to be like in 40 degrees, which is roughly the same temperature as your body, how easy it is to boil over. Now, if you go out hard in a race in cold temperatures and you get a little bit too hot, it's not so much of a problem because you can slow down, cool down quickly and get back to normal. If you go out too hard in a stage of the MDS on a very hot day and boil over, it's almost impossible to get your core body temperature back down to sensible levels. And then you'll find yourself having to walk and, and trudge and maybe even sit and just pour water over yourself to cool down. And it can be very dispiriting and it can really take it out of you. So starting with a conservative pacing strategy for each day and also over the course of the event is is very very important and I think that comes down to a couple of things it comes down to being realistic about your expectations and really understanding what pace you should be able to hold in those conditions we all get quite excited before big events that we've trained a long time for if you're competitive you'll be looking down the results sheet at where people in your age group finished how many hours it took them you can work out average speeds and whenever I've done that for the MDS and I'm not someone who's done the MDS I've looked at those average speeds and thought that looks pretty easy they don't move that fast. And even when I was chatting to Pierre, and I know how fast Pierre is, I was amazed at the kind of average speeds he set himself as someone who has achieved the top 10 and thinking, wow, that doesn't sound too bad. But that's just a marker of what the environment does to you. If you're ambitious with your pacing, or even worse, if you go out and think, I'll see how I feel and run without a plan to, to pace, almost inevitably, the adrenaline and the excitement will take you out too hard and it can be really tough to come back from that. So I'll let Pierre talk about how he established his pacing routine and how he stuck to it in the event. Um, yeah, I agree completely with Andy on that one. It, um, your pacing strategy is very important. If you want to run the MDS, um, don't overestimate what you're gonna be running at. Uh, 10 kilometers per hour will get you in the top 20. So if you go above that, which most people we do on a Sunday run or something like this, 11k an hour, it's quite easy, 12k an hour. Intervals, we hit 15k an hour or, or more, depending on your levels. But if you think about the whole week, you will be going over 3,000 meters of elevation in total throughout the week, more or less. You'll do close to 250 kilometers. Try to be reasonable with your target. If it's eight kilometers per hour, nine kilometers per hour, you'd be in the top 100 or something. Yeah, so when the idea is to try and identify the different kind of terrain you will encounter. If you encounter a hard, rocky terrain, having a nine to 10 kilometers per hour average, that moment will be reasonable. If you're in the sand, don't hesitate to walk it. If you're going uphill, definitely walk it. If you're going downhill, it's technical and it's tricky, it's sandy, try to walk it. So you're gonna be running not that much. And when you do, keep it very low. As Andy said, the margin between being comfortable at your pace and being lying down and suffering from overheating is very, very difficult to judge. And it's a very, very small barrier. So don't overexert yourself early on in the day. Wait for the last stage because when you start at 9 a.m., three hours later, you haven't finished the stage and it's midday and it's already 45 degrees in the heat. Your body temperature will go up even though your pace has gone actually down. So don't plan on just going too fast. Just take it easy and really enjoy the moment, enjoy your pace, stick to what you've done in training. And one last thing on that topic is when I was in Spain, I was able to monitor my heart rate at different speed for different temperatures. And I knew at 35 degrees in full sun, I was able to have 20 pulses higher per minute for the exact same pace when I was running in the sand. So nothing changed from road to sand, all the environment was the same but just because of the softness of the sand, I was 20 pulse higher. So if you try to go faster, if you alter all of these, these, uh, these markers, your heart rate will go much higher, the body temperature will be much higher. So then you, you'll have to walk at some point because you will not have dealt adequately with those changes in the first place. So just try to train in something that you can monitor, go with a plan and stick to the plan and be conservative with that plan. And stay behind Rashid. <laughs> Even at the start, don't sprint to be on the pictures or something. Just stay behind him. He starts, I was very surprised. Day one, I start with my plan, 10K an hour. And Rashid is nowhere to be seen. And I turn around and Rashid and Mohammed are 200 meters behind. 
and that lasted for a good five to ten kilometers. And then they run with us, and then they say, goodbye, everyone. You know, I had a good warm-up. Thank you very much. So just stay behind them, honestly, just from the start. Yeah, that's, that's a great illustration of it, Pierre, because, you know, start conservatively for you on each day. It, it will help your thermoregulation. The other thing it will do is it is so psychologically beneficial to be moving forwards through the field rather than backwards. The vast majority of people will start too fast, they will suffer and they will slow down. And if you can be picking them off in the later part of the day, that is a great feeling to be someone who's moving forward, moving faster than the average of the people around you. So just try and remember that. Write it on your hand if you need to. It sounds like a really easy thing to do, I promise you. In endurance events in general, it is one of the most difficult skills to master, especially in a big and exciting event where you want to do well. But if you start conservatively, you will have a wonderful day. If you go out hard, you might have a fantastic day and you might win, but there's a chance that you might not as well. So just start, start nice and steady. Last one, point four, is hydration. We sweat to cool down because the evaporation of sweat off the surface of the skin is a very, very effective way of removing heat. It's the most effective method we have for losing heat from the body and it works really, really well in a hot, dry environment like in the desert because that's where we're evolved to, to uh, well, that's where we're adapted and evolved from. The downside of sweating a lot is that it costs us valuable resources in the body. So we lose water and we lose electrolytes. And those need to be replaced to a, to a lesser or greater extent to maintain your hydration status and principally while you're exercising to maintain your blood volume because otherwise you have to slow down it can cause all sorts of problems. The reason it's about maintaining blood volume is because when you sweat, that, that water that comes out of your body is from your blood plasma. And the reason that water has so many electrolytes in it is because there are so many electrolytes in your blood. So you lose sodium predominantly in your sweat because it's the most predominant electrolyte found in your blood. You've got around 3,600 milligrams of sodium per litre of blood and you can lose anywhere from about 200 to 2,000 milligrams of sodium per litre of sweat. And it's that point that there's a big range in sweat sodium losses that is worth talking about. So that graph up on the... Um, up on the wall now shows you how variable sweat sodium losses can be between people. And this is something which I learned the hard way as an endurance athlete many years ago in that my sweat sodium level is right to the right hand of that chart. It's at about 1800 milligrams per litre. And that meant that for years when I was doing triathlons predominantly, Ironman races in hot conditions, I was one of those people that looked like a sorry state in the medical tent with a couple of IVs plugged into me because every time I would end up in a, in a really bad way through a combination of dehydration and hyponatremia, which is low blood volume and low blood sodium levels. And that was caused by a mixture of either not taking enough electrolytes or over drinking water or a bit of both. Now, this is such an individual thing. There is no one size fits all guidance that you can give for how to hydrate in the desert. Well, what we do know is that your fluid needs are going to be significantly greater than they are in normal environments. And for a lot of people, your electrolyte and your sodium needs are going to be a lot higher as well. So a level of trial and error, a level of investigation, maybe even having a sweat test. We've got sweat tests going on out in the atrium here today. If you want to learn a bit more about that, is a really, really invaluable part of preparing yourself for a week in the desert. Because if you turn out to be one of those people like myself with higher than average sweat and sodium losses, at least it allows you to go into the desert environment prepared with a plan of how you're going to replace those electrolytes. And this is an area where, where Pierre and I actually first met because Pierre had a sweat test in, as part of his preparation for MDS 2021. And so it's a good idea for me to let him talk about that, what he learned from it and how he used that information to inform his electrolyte plan for the event. Yeah, I tried to do my sweat test at the expo and it was fully booked, so I couldn't. Uh, so if you haven't done one, honestly, it's the best 100 quid you're going to spend towards the MDS preparation. It's a, a, a lifelong uh, data that you're going to be using in the future. I did mind the day that we, use the, um, that we do the ECG with um, Rory's brother. 
so that was in London. So Abby from Precision Fuel and Hydration did that for me. She gave me a value of 921, which is pretty much in the middle range, uh, which is what I had in mind. I'm not a very big sweater. But however, I knew that uh, my value, before doing, before doing the sweat test, I had done some uh, fluid loss test, which you can do on a hot day. You go and you, you weigh yourself before at home, uh, no clothes on. You go and run in the hot environment, let's say an hour exactly, quite high intensity. You come back home, you go back on the scale, and you deduct whatever amount you've drank. For me, that was 1.5 liter. So the 921 milligrams of sodium per liter of sweat was multiplied by the 1.5. So it gave me grossly 1,500 milli milligrams of sodium per hour of exercise. Yeah? Simple math. The sweat test and your fluid loss multiplied gives you the number. So 1,500. I went into the MDS with that value. I knew I was going to do about 10 kilometers per hour average. So a normal stage, which is 35K, should be three and a half hours. So I knew I would have to take 1,500 milligrams of sodium times 3.5. So every day I had my plan, how many tablets of um, pH 1500 do I need? How many salt capsules do I need? And, and pretty much every day I stick to that. And I had no cramping through the week. Uh, I had no dizziness. I uh, didn't pass out or anything. I didn't end up in the medical tent with an IV fluid. I had no penalty or anything like that. So everything worked really, really well. And I put it down mostly to, yes, I was fit and I was a good runner, but I was mostly very keen to succeed and complete that dream race for me. And to do that, I had just one plan, my pacing and uh, my flu fluid and, and, and nutrition. So try and get that number because it's very important. As Andy said, if you're in the 500 category or if you're in the 1500 category, it changes what you have to carry to cope with that 45 degree in the heat. So knowing that number is very important. And for me, I think that's what helped me and that's what got me into the top 10. So when I go next year, now I know that value. I know a few things I can tweak to even get even better and see if we can replicate that performance. Thanks, Pierre. And I think it was a good point that Pierre made about the sweat loss test that's very easy to do. You can do that at home. You can weigh yourself before and after some training sessions and you can start to get an idea of how much fluid you're losing by weighing yourself because one litre of water weighs approximately one kilogram. And so if you do a session, you lose two kilos, you know you've lost about two liters. If you do that enough times in different conditions at different intensities, you get an appreciation for your sweat rate. And there's actually a, a blog on our website at precisionfuelandhydration.com in the Knowledge Hub. If you search in there for sweat rate testing, you can download a free spreadsheet to put your data into and it will work out your spreadsheet based on the amount of weight you've lost, the amount of fluid that you drank and the duration of that exercise session. The other really important point that Pierre made was that if you're weighing yourself naked, you do that at home and not in the gym because <laughs> you will lose your gym membership if you weigh yourself naked in the gym. Yeah, so figure out your fluid and sodium needs before you go. And then, he's already said it, but I realised I left my slide in here of Pierre with his quote from last year. So there you go. Um, I'll move on from that. We're getting close on time. If you'd like to talk to anyone specifically about heat acclimation training, Tristan, I've called him Jack there. There's a reason for that. Um, Jack's not been able to make it today because he's ill, but Tristan is equally as qualified as Jack to talk to you about heat acclimation. And he's with Elliot on the Porsche Human Performance Stand. He's also going to be at the door at the back. If you'd like him to send you some information, he can take your email address and do that. My crew from Precision Fuel and Hydration are doing sweat tests out in the hall. We have taken a lot of bookings, so I don't know if we've got capacity to do any more today, but if not, you can go and talk to the guys. You can express interest and we can organize other testing sessions. We've also got tools and blogs and articles on our website, precisionfuelandhydration.com, that, that help you to understand your sweat and salt losses and, and individual needs. So, if nothing else, it's worth hitting that up and having a read to, to see if you can learn anything from there. Yeah, thanks very much, and we'll leave it there.